morning, everyone. You're welcome to Bible study. God bless you. This is I Believe Bible Fellowship. We're in Houston, Texas. And we're a bunch of believers who love the Lord unashamedly and unreservedly. We study scriptures verse by verse because the Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. And we believe no one buys uh, a book and jumps about the paragraphs, the sentences, the chapters in the book. But you read it from start to finish. That way you're able to understand it. What we do in church on Sunday is great. The man of God or the woman of God takes a piece of scripture, builds a, a message around it. You learn the lesson from that message, but you still do not know the book. So I'm grateful to God that he set us up this way to study the book, the word of God, verse by verse. And God has been faithful to us. We are seeing tremendous responses to our growth and to our prayers. To him be all the glory. We are concluding the book of Second Chronicles today, and I anticipate that we'll be able to move quite quickly uh, through the next few books. They're not very lengthy. Uh, should, shouldn't take us more than three weeks maximum to finish um, Ezra all the way to Esther. And then the book of Job is lengthy. The Psalms are lengthy. And we might spend some time in those uh, books. Today we'll pick it up from chapter 34. Father, breathe upon your word, we ask. Teach us by your spirit. Give us insights, give us understanding. Give us knowledge. Help us to see the wisdom that's in it and then teach us how to apply it daily in our lives so that our lives may reflect that which we profess to believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Second Chronicles 34. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem one and thirty years. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above. Them he cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images he break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burned the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, with their maddocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maaseah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, and of all the remnant of Israel, and all of Judah and Benjamin, and they returned to Jerusalem. And they put it in the hand of the workmen that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and amend the house. Even to the artificers and builders gave they it to buy hewn stone and timber for couplings, and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. And the men did the work faithfully, and the overseers of them were Jehath and Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Merari, and Zechariah and Meshulam of the sons of Kohathites, to set it forward, and other of the Levites, all that could skill of instruments of music. Also, they were over the bearers of burdens, and were overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service, and of the Levites, there were scribes and officers and porters. And when they brought out the money, 
that was brought into the house of the Lord. Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. And Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, All that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it into the hand of the overseers and to the hand of the workmen. Then Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asaiah, a servant of the king's, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord, to do after all that is written in this book. And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvath, the son of Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwells in Jerusalem in the college, and they speak to her to that effect. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell ye the man that sent you to me. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. Even all the curses that are written in the book, which they have read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be poured out upon this place and shall not be quenched. And as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall ye say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thy because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou hearest his word against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, and humblest thyself before me, and didst rend thy clothes, and weep before me. I have even heard thee also saith the Lord. Behold, I will gather thee to thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace. Neither shall thine eyes see all the evil that I will bring upon his upon this place, and upon the inhabitants of the same. So they brought the king word again. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord, and all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in this book. And he caused all that were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Josiah took away all the abominations out of all the countries that pertained to the children of Israel and made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God. And all his days they departed not from, the, from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Lengthy chapter, a lot to learn from it. Praise God forevermore. Now, Josiah began to reign when he was just a lad, eight years old. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. So um, he too died early. That's pretty sad. But the Bible says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of David his father, and turned not to the left or to the right hand. Right? That's the summary of his lifetime. But then scriptures begin to break down specifics that God would have us learn from. 
The Bible says in the eighth year of his reign, that is to say when he was just 16 years old. Our own 16 year olds are in TikTok and Instagram and, and uh, whatever else is out there, I don't know. This is what they spend their time doing. Even the adults amongst us are not guiltless. There's nothing like a time waster than your phone. If you're not working with it and earning from it, you got to repent. The phone, it's cost, it's a good tool. And the wisdom and the knowledge and all of that came from the hand of our Father God. But there's a good way to use a good thing. And there's a bad way to use a good thing. Go and check the, uh, what, what's it called now? There's, there's something in the iPhone that tells you how, screen time. That's what I'm looking for. The amount of time that you spend in it. Husbands and wives, they're sitting down in the living room. They're in their phones. Parents and children, they're in their phones. God help you if you have a teenager. You won't see him or her. They'll only come downstairs when it's time to eat or when they want something from you. It's, it's, it's a great divider. There's a, there's a film on uh, Netflix. I'm not sure if it's on YouTube. Where the people who used to work in that industry have left and they've now made videos to tell us the dangers that are inherent in the use of the phone. It has substituted time that we should spend with family. It has substituted time that we should spend before God. It has substituted time that we should spend developing ourselves. Sixteen years old, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of David, his father, and did not lean to the right or lean to the left. As we read on, we find out that he really didn't even have the word. But he had the heart to walk with God. And God said, if you seek me, you will find me. It's an assurance. He's not a man that he should lie. So the best way he knew how, even though he didn't have the Bible of their time, which is the law of Moses, the best that he could, he walked with God and he was only 16 years old. What's your excuse? You think the study of the word is for pastors alone? You got to know the word for yourself. You're responsible for what you hear. You're responsible for what you take into your heart. The Bible says, guard your heart diligently. For from it flows the issues of life. Not everybody should be speaking into your life. He walked in the ways of his father. The Bible says in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And when we get to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, as a matter of fact, let's go there. I'll still teach it. Doesn't stop me from teaching it when we eventually get there. But come to Ecclesiastes 12 and see what the word of God has to say. Ecclesiastes, where are you? Chapter 12. It says, remember now. Not sometime later, not when I'm settled, not when I finally get married and I'm in my home, or I get my own apartment and I'm my own person. No, remember him now. In the days of your youth. There's a reason why God said that. All right. In the days of your youth. Before the evil days come. What does that tell me? 
It tells me that as I progressively age, evil days will come. God doesn't leave you without understanding. All right? Now the years draw nigh when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. I'm there right now in my life. And I'm only 66. Nothing excites me. There's nothing new. There's nothing you're going to tell me that I'm going to be. No. Been there, done that, won the t-shirt. Seen it. While you're still young, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, talking about your eyes when you age and you cannot see the way you ought to see anymore. It's not talking about the sun, literal sun. All right. Now the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, that's your body. As you age, for some people, their hands begin to tremble. If they're really, really old, everything about them trembles. This is what the Bible is teaching in Ecclesiastes 12. All right. The strong men shall bow themselves, talking about your legs. I just started riding again because I found out that bending down and, and getting up was becoming difficult. So I'm back on my bike to strengthen my legs. These things are inevitable, people of God. Much as we want to take care of the spirit, we got to take care of the body as well because the body can hinder. The spirit. All right. It goes on to say the grinders cease because they are few. Your teeth. All right. A beautiful white smile. I promise you. Not all of it is mine. It goes on to say. And those that look out of the windows be darkened. Again, it's talking about your eyes. And the doors shall be shut in the street when the sound of the grinding is low. Your ears. And it shall rise about the voice of the bird and all the daughters of the music shall be brought low. When they shall be afraid of that which is high. I don't climb anymore. The last time I went up on a ladder was in 2016. I fell off a ladder. I broke two ribs. It took two years to heal. All right? Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way. As people get older, they get more fearful. All right? And the almond tree shall flourish. That's when all of your hair turns white. Solomon was a poet. I'm going to stop there. Let me not break all of it down. He was a poet. So he was writing and he was telling young people, remember God now. There's nothing you are doing, nothing that you're doing that's more important than your relationship with God. The system is stacked against us believers. They got you working 26 hours of the day. They don't pay you what you're worth so that they can keep you in bondage. And you got to do two, three jobs just to make ends meet. And when we teach you the principles of finances here, it goes in one ear, it comes out the other. When we say give, it goes in one ear, it comes out the other. It's how you get. Remember him while you are young. The situation is stacked up against us. We are in the world, but we're not of the systems of this world. Therefore, we've got to depend on the system that he set up for his own, his children. That's how we get over. He began to seek after God, the, uh, the God of uh, David, his father. And in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem. Apparently, he was now able to, um, to influence both the northern and the southern kingdom. 
All right. He was eight when he started reigning. He was 16 when he started seeking God. He was 20 when he got up and began to purge the land. 20 year old. Where are our own 20 year olds now? What's their interest? It's like there's no shame, there's no decorum, there's no order, there's, there's nothing in the lives of our young people. The university campuses, parents labor over their children from the time they're born. They struggle with them in junior high, they still struggle with them in, in high school, but there's still some control and some measure of discipline. But once they go off to the university, that's it, you've lost them. Except if you have taken the pains to instill in them the truth of the word of God. And even then, peer pressure. Sometimes I think about the Amish and I don't blame them. I don't blame them for refusing to change and remaining the way that they are. Because sometimes... No matter how much you've labored over these children, once they leave the home, that's it. Unless God has mercy and you, the parent, you keep interceding. God has to touch the hearts of our youth. That's why we have the 35 and under. That's who God really called me to. I appreciate all you that are, uh, what do they call you guys? Salted saints, <laughs> right? I, I, I love and I appreciate you. I, I still get wisdom from you. Several of you, I call you, I talk to you, I text with you. I still learn from you. But at 35 and under, that's where our hearts should be. We need to be able to leave a vibrant church for them. For them to know that he's still a healer. For them to know that his word is true and unshakable. For them to know that there is nothing else to depend on in this life other than God. For their marriages to be strong. For their children to be raised in the fear, in the nurture, and in the admonition of the Lord. We've got to hand that over to them. Twenty years old, he began to purge Jerusalem and Judah. That's the southern kingdom from all the high places and the groves. So these high places were either rebuilt, because we've read of kings who tore everything down, or maybe they didn't tear all of them down. So he went out and he began to purge the land again, remove all the high places and all the graves, all the carved images, all the molten images, Breaking down the altar of Baal because they were still worshipping Baal even in the southern kingdom. Because they were copying the guys in the northern kingdom and they were copying all the nations around them. Ungodly nations. Nations that were driven out because they were God's special people. The Bible says, uh, verse 4, he broke down the altars of Baal in his presence. He went to those places. He didn't send soldiers or workmen. He would be standing there and he would say, all right, hew it down. Grind it to powder. Set it on fire. He supervised it. They did it in his presence and the images that were on high above them, he cut down. And the groves and the carved images and the molten images, he break in pieces and he made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. So he killed those that were still worshipping these strange gods. We can't do that today, but we certainly can pray. We certainly have influence in the spirit realm. We have power, dominion, and authority. We can bind, we can lose. We can intercede for our family members that don't know the Lord yet, our friends, our, our acquaintances, our, our, our colleagues on the job. We can intercede for them. He brought the bones of the priests upon their, their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And he did the same thing with Manasseh and Ephraim, Simeon and Naphtali, and all the small villages around them. 
when I had broken down all the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder, I cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he then returned to Jerusalem. He went and supervised all of it. In the 18th year of his reign, so if he started at 8 plus 18, that would be 26. Am I right? Or 36. When he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maaseah, the governor of the city, and Joah and Joahaz, the recorder, to go and repair the house of the Lord. Restoration in the house of the Lord. Sin in the pulpit must stop. Sin in the pews must stop. God should begin to expose any and everybody that is leading the people astray. Laying hands on the people of God with the crazy demons still in them that they are fighting. God, the Bible says judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. Somebody help me put scriptures up. As they come to me, I'll throw them out. Judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. We got to cleanse ourselves first. We can't still be nursing any nonsense and hope or expect that we can be effective out there. I've shared with you before, there was one time I was conducting a deliverance. It was a very difficult deliverance. I invited someone, a minister of God, to join me. The devil in the woman said to him, who are you talking to? You, that you. I just jumped in and I said, be quiet and live in the name of the Lord Jesus. I knew what Satan was trying to do. Apparently, there must have been something in the life of this man of God. And the devil was going to expose him. And I knew once that was done, the deliverance was over. We have to become prayers. I'm using that uh, uh, as in, in present continuous tense. People who pray. Like dancers, prayers. We have to be people who pray all the time. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit, so we have no excuse. It's a completely different faculty. Can be driving and be praying in tongues. It doesn't disturb my driving. I can be cooking and praying in tongues. It doesn't disturb my cooking. I can be doing my laundry and be speaking in tongues. I can be walking to my mailbox and be speaking in tongues. We have to pray all the time. How many of you do prayer walks in your neighborhood? I do, Pastor Mark. God. Crystal. I ride in and out. I live in a very small subdivision, only 50 homes. And I ride in and out of the close. It's four closes and one main street that takes us out the gate. I'm riding in and out of it. And as I'm riding in and out of it, I am praying and I'm speaking the word and I'm commanding devils to bow. Some of these homes have gods in front of them. See Catholics, they will have the effigy of Mary out there. Mary who said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. The, uh, the uh, wedding in Cana of Galilee. Isn't that what she told the guys when they went to say the wine was, was finished? And they found two earthen pots and they said, fill it with water. She told the guys, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Luke chapter 2. Jesus said, go and wait in Jerusalem. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. She went there and waited with the disciples. So how is it that she's being worshipped? As what? As a God? People are steeped in tradition because my great-grandfather was Catholic and my great-great-grandmother was Catholic and my grandfather was Catholic, my mother was Catholic, so I would die Catholic. 
examine everything in the light of scriptures. If it doesn't align, no matter how you're feeling, no matter what you think, no matter what's going on, you chalk it. The word of God is the final arbiter. The people that are not talking to me because I I I I was I voted for Donald Trump. They brought a psychologist onto a show on, on TV and they asked the question, what should people do now that Thanksgiving is coming up and, and uh, Christmas holidays are coming up? And even families are divided because some voted one way, others voted the other way. This psychology person, this psychiatrist or whatever she was, this dude from Harvard, said they shouldn't go home for Thanksgiving or Christmas if they feel uncomfortable with family. It is 100% Satan. They should not go home. Guys, you should be praying. You should be doing what? You should be praying because you, you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Don't play with that gift. It's, it's powerful. The Bible says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God. It's 1-800-HEAVEN. No man understands in him. How be it? He utters mysteries in the spirit. You pray beyond your understanding, beyond your mind when you pray in tongues. There's an app that shows you sex offenders in your neighborhood. Go one day and just open it and see how many of them are living around you. You take it a lot for granted. You got to be constantly in touch with headquarters, heaven. So he began the repair of the house of the Lord. All right. I'm going to skip because I've, I've, I've said more than I even had in mind to say. Praising, praise, praise the Lord. So all the money that was brought in, they put it in the hand of workmen. And those that had oversight over the house of the Lord, verse 10, so that they could begin to work and to repair and amend the house. All right. They did the work faithfully, verse 12. There were bearers of burdens, there were overseers, all right, there were Levites, scribes, officers, porters, everybody came to fix the house of the Lord. And when they were doing that, the Bible says, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given to Moses. It was in there. When, what's the name of the king that shot the house of the Lord up. And that's how it seems today. Because there'll be many who will not read the Bible. There are scores who don't even believe. What well, scores? Thousands who don't even believe the Bible is, is, is the word of God. Officially now, the United Kingdom is not a Christian nation. America is hot on her heels. The guy answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law, I'm in verse 15, in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shaphan. Shaphan carried the book to the king and brought the king word back again, saying, all that was committed to thy servants, they have done, they have, they have done it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord. They've del delivered it into the hands of those that will work. Then they brought to the king's attention that they had found the book. The king must have told him, read it to me. And so, verse 18, Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And he commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam, 
the son of Shaphan, and Abdon, the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Asaiah, his servant of the kings, saying, Go and inquire of the Lord for me, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, Israel and Judah, northern and southern kingdom. Concerning the words of the book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do of, after all that is written in this book. Now, the Bible tells us that Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for 31 years. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, walked in the ways of David his father, declined neither to the left nor to the right. It says in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he was 16, he began to seek after God. He didn't have the word. But there was something on the inside of him that made him begin to seek after God. Cannot be anyone other than the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ said, all that the Father has given to me will come to me. So I want to put that scripture up. And whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast away. God is the one who draws. That's why we intercede. So that God will draw that guy, draw that girl, draw that man, draw that woman, draw that child. We have to pray. We have to, quote unquote, permit God to work. Psalm 115, I think it's verse 16. It says the earth. He has given to the sons of men. The heavens, even the highest heavens, are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the sons of men. That is why it is illegal for any spirit being to operate on earth without the consent of a man, including Almighty God himself. Because he will not violate his own word. He's a spirit being. It's illegal for spirit beings to operate on earth. They need a body. That's why we can cast devils out. They're illegal occupants, either of a person's body or of trees or rivers or rocks or whatever they choose to inhabit. Spirits must have a physical thing to inhabit on earth for them to be able to operate. Their number one choice is humans because they have the highest freedom. They can travel, they can fly, they can drive, they can do whatever as long as they reside in that person. If they cannot find a person, they will settle for animals. It could be a dog, it could be whatever. If they cannot find animals, then they will settle in inanimate things. It could be a river, it could be a rock, it could be a wilderness, a bush. You have that in Africa. People worship rivers. At the time to worship it, if they don't go and sacrifice to it, it's going to overflow its banks and destroy the village. Well, it's a demon that's inside that river that receives the worship. And when you don't take the worship to it, it causes calamity to create more fear, to bring you to quickly come and appease it. That's how it works. So for God to move on earth, his people must pray. He's a spirit. He cannot come on earth unless we allow it. That's what Jesus Christ said. I think it's Matthew 18, 1. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. That's how you bring God into the realm of the physical. He's a spirit being. He can't show up. He could have done that when he wanted to come and do the work of redemption, the work of salvation. But he had to come through the birth canal of a woman. It's the only legitimate way to come to planet earth. Any other way is illegal. That's why when Jesus Christ was leaving, he constituted another body that he called the body of Christ. And he sent the Holy Spirit to come and indwell the body of Christ to have legitimate uh, legitimacy to be able to operate on earth. But how many of us engage the Holy Spirit? How many of us give him the latitude to use us and flow through us or you think it's only for pastors? He was seeking the Lord. Something was drawing him to seek the Lord. But he didn't even have the full counsel of the word of God. So don't wait until you know the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. The small that you know, start using it. 
John 3, 16 is the most popular scripture in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Go and study John chapter 3. If you understand John chapter 3 very well, you can become a tool in the hand of Almighty God. That chapter alone. So when he now heard the word of the book, the Bible says he was distraught. He tore his clothes. He couldn't believe all that he heard. And then he sent them to go and inquire in Israel and in Judah, northern and southern kingdom, concerning the word of the book that is found. Because great is the wrath of the Lord. He saw that they hadn't even been doing God's will. Whatever they were doing was not it. Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed, they went to hold out the prophetess. And for those who are saying a woman cannot be a pastor, I'm sorry for you. You are ignorant. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how big your church is. God doesn't use the human body. There's no good thing in the flesh. Like I always say, don't bathe it for a few days. You will know that it's rotten. God uses the spirit. And the spirit has no sex. It's my physical body. Write your questions down. I'll take them when I finish. It's my physical body that is female. And he made me female for purpose. I had to be Ariane's mom. I had to be David's mom. I had to be Valerie's mom. So I had to come as a woman. Children are born. Sons are given. That's what the Bible says. So when God flows through me, he's not really using my body. He's, he's in my spirit. And my spirit can only find expression in this physical, female physical body. God put it inside. He said to Jeremiah, I said, before you were formed in the belly, I knew you. I was in existence before Benjamin spoke to Margaret. Hold her. The king sent. Go and inquire of her. It was tradition in the Corinthian church. It was the most disorderly church of all the churches that, that Paul uh, planted. They come and they fight over the bread and the communion. They don't wait for each other. A man was sleeping with his father's wife. They were doing all kinds of crazy things. Go and read First and Second Corinthians. So when Paul says, I forbid the woman to speak, it's because of order. And the way they used to sit in the sanctuary back in the day, the men sat on the floor, the, the, the apostles or the rabbis or whatever sat in front. There was no Bible to read. They just had the book of the law and it was only the priest that read it. The women were either behind a lattice or if there was a gallery, they were up somewhere in the gallery. So it would be disorderly for everybody to be talking. Paul said, ask your husband the questions. And then when they come to church, when you all come to church, the men will ask the questions. It was basically patrilineal societies. That's why women did not have a voice. Paul walked with a female apostle. I think it's in Romans 16, if I'm not mistaken. I forget her name. Let me see if I can find it and, and give it to you. What is Romans? Thank you, Holy Ghost. The Tabitha? No, no, no. It's, her name starts with a J. Maybe Junior. Romans 16, 7. Salute Andronicus and Junior, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles. Junior. And who also were in Christ before me. Jesus is the one who appoints apostles. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave some to be apostles. Some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors, some to be teachers. Is Paul going to tell Jesus what to do? It's extra. 
Let's continue our study this morning. I'm back in uh, Second Chronicles. So, <clears throat> and Hilkiah, verse 22, and they that the king had appointed went to hold out the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvath, the son of ha Hasra, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they speak to her to that effect. And she answered them, Thus saith the Lord. A woman, men sent to her to inquire of the Lord. God said the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof. You remember God had said during the time of, what's this other king? Hezekiah, whose heart was lifted up and he had that brief stint of uh, not, not being up well up here. He repented and God restored him. He lived very well up until that time that pride came into his heart. And God said to him, all right, the punishment will come, but it will not come during your, your reign. Same thing with uh, uh, Solomon. God said the punishment will come. Uh, I mean, David. God said the punishment will come, but I won't do it during the reign of Solomon. I will do it after. And the punishment came after Solomon. So for Hulda, or Hulda to be telling them that this is what God is going to say, go, what, what God is going to do, uh, the B part of verse 25, my wrath shall be poured out upon the place and shall not be quenched. God's word will never fail. And sin will not go unpunished. All right? As for the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, so shall you say unto him, thus said the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words that you have heard. Because your heart is tender and you humbled yourself before God and you heard his word against this place and against the inhabitants thereof and you humbled yourself before me and rent your clothes and wept before me i've heard you also i will gather you to your fathers you will live well you will die peacefully but afterwards judgment will come god is constant he doesn't change so the king went and gathered the elders of uh, judah and jerusalem went up to the house of the lord all the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, priests, Levites, all of them. And they read the word of God. He compelled them to sit down and listen to the word of God being read. There are five ways we handle the word of God. Maybe seven. We read the word of God. We hear the word of God. We speak the word of God. We pray with the word of God. I don't remember all of them, but there's about seven. We memorize the word of God. So they read the word of the uh, the book, the words of the book. I mean, the B part of verse 30. He read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant that was found in the house of the Lord. How many of you in your church, they still read the word? Talk to me. Unmute yourselves. I know people in my church do, um, and very often because we have conversations. No, I'm talking about during service to read the word of the Lord. Oh, no, always. It's not done anymore. Always. My church does. You could tune in and see um, our pastor. I, I, know, he, I know your church. I've been there. Your pastors are my friends. Oh, but no, I, I go to a New Beginnings church also. But I do go to Hope Cathedral occasionally, but I, I, I my home church is like five minutes from my house. I, and I thought Hope was your home church. No, um, it's it's fairly, um, it's like a half an hour away. And the church okay. where I serve at, I am able to work as the body of Christ in like the food pantry and the Thanksgiving um supplies and we did um clothing collections for uh the hurricane and um my my thing is during service no is yes, there a time dedicated do. to the reading of the word of god uh, when the man of god is going to preach he will tell you i'm, I'm coming out of luke 8 or whatever that's all pastor Joe but, but it's not the, the the church today is not given to the reading of the word reading Apostle Paul said to Timothy, till like Tom, give place to the reading of the word of God. 
Somebody put that scripture up. Glory to God. The word of the book into their ears so that they now heard the word. Verse 31, the king stood in his place, made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments, his testimonies, his statutes with all his heart and with all his soul to perform the words of the covenant which are written in the book. When you expose your spirit to the word of God, it will change you. I'm talking about the, the one scripture here, another scripture there that your daily devotional said you should read. It's not how you read the word. So those of you who come here consistently, after two years, you will shock yourself. Unless you don't take in what we are learning every day. Your faith will never remain the same again. There's something the word of God does. Go to Psalm 19. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And I've told you multiple times, I, 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 I didn't just begin to read the, the book and memorize the book when, when I became a pastor. I've been like this since I was 17. Psalms 19, I said, right? Verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. There are laws in the word of God and it's able to convert your soul. Psalm 19 verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. It converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. Simple is an old English word for a fool. And a fool is not, uh, uh, when you say call someone a fool, it's not being abusive. It's descriptive. Someone who lacks wisdom is foolish. When the Lord say, talks about a fool, he's not being rude or abusive or whatever. He's just describing the condition of that person. And it's, it's not permanent. Foolery is not permanent. You replace whatever it is with wisdom, you become wise. All right? So you have the law. That's the first one. It is perfect. It is able to convert the soul. You have the testimony. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes the fool wise. The statutes, that's number three. You have statutes in the word of God. The statutes of the Lord are right. It causes your heart to rejoice. Number four, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So when we read the word, we're looking for those things in the word so that we can know how to apply it in our lives. Praise God forevermore. I'm back in 2 Chronicles. So he sought the Lord with all of his heart. He made a covenant with God that he would perform all the words of the covenant that are written in the book. He caused all that were pre pre present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to stand to it. The inhabitants of Jerusalem, they did according to the covenant of God. He brought them all into that covenant that we will serve God and we will follow his word. Josiah took away all the abominations out of the countries that pertain to the children of Israel. So he went to the north and he cleaned out all the nonsense that Jeroboam had set up hundreds of years prior. And made all that were present in Israel to serve, even to serve the Lord their God and all his days. They departed not from following the Lord and uh, the God of their fathers. Questions, thoughts. Andrew, your hand was up. Um, I think, uh, Crystal, your hand was also up. I'll take Andrew first. Um, good morning, Pastor. Good morning. <laughs> I stepped out of my car. Uh, so I wanted to answer um, a ways back, you know, when you were talking about the Catholic Church and people worshiping Mary. Actually, the Catholic, Catholic Church devised a plan to have their Greek gods worshiped because when Jesus came, he like, he shook it all up and people stopped worshiping the Greek gods. So they took the people from the scriptures and they disguised their false gods as them. So Athena is disguised as Mary basically. So that's why they give so much emphasis to her. 
I've heard different, you know, but it doesn't make any difference to me what they say or how they want to term it. I've heard that Jesus Christ and Mary, uh, the infant child and, and the woman that's carrying the infant child, are uh, Isis and Osiris. So there are all kinds of whatever out there. The bottom line is Jesus Christ is God. Yeah. And only, and only him should we serve. That is 100% correct. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, and there also has been studies done that show that when people are speaking in tongues, there's actually another uh, wavelength, a brain wavelength that happens. So it is the Send person that study can, too. can work independently. So yeah, so I, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've seen the study too. Uh, mm -hmm. The things that they're beginning to discover they're in the Bible. If only they would read the book. You know, I've seen that study. Um, yeah. I, I also saw one at the moment, as a matter of fact, I screen recorded that so that I can I can always have it. The moment the, the sperm penetrates the, the ovum, there's a spark of light. Yes, I've seen that study as well. Yeah. That is and, awesome. And <laughs> that's the moment the Spirit of God comes into the two the zygotes. Mm -hmm. And conception begins from that moment. Because it's tucked away in your tummy and it's and it's doing what it's supposed to do, growing, you, you think you can just flush it out. God have mercy on us. And I pray Amen. that those 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 little ones they, they will forgive their mothers. Yes. Amen. All right. Uh Crystal, you had your hand up. Crystal, are you still with us? Ms. Robbins? All right. Anybody else has any uh, comments, any questions? Okay. Chapter 35. Uh, before I go on to 35, let me do this. I see... I see uh, a gentleman that I'm seeing for the first time. If you've been before, I apologize. Kian Bruni, I want to welcome you to, I believe, Bible Fellowship. Um, we're glad to have you. Right? It's not an all-women fellowship because a gentleman had come in one time and said, is this, is this an all-women fellowship? It's not. It's just that brothers don't come as often as they ought to. So we're glad to see you. All right, chapter 35. Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to the service of the house of the Lord, and said unto the Levites that taught all Israel, which were holy unto the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. It shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. And prepare yourselves by the houses of your fathers after your courses, according to the writing of David, king of Israel, and according to the writing of Solomon, his son. And stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the families of the fathers of your brethren, the people. And after the division of the families of the Levites, so kill the Passover and sanctify yourselves and prepare your brethren that they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses." And Josiah gave the people of the flock, lambs, and kids, all for the Passover offerings, for all that were present, to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bullocks. These were the king's substance. And his princes gave willingly unto the people, to the priests, and to the Levites, Hilkiah, and Zechariah, and Jehiel, rulers of the house of God, gave unto the priests for the Passover offerings of 2,600 small cattle and 300 oxen. Conaniah also, and Shemaiah, and Nathaniel, his brethren, and Hashabiah, and Jael, and Joe Zabad, chief of the Levites, give unto the Levites for Passover offerings, 5,000 small cattle and 500 oxen. So the service was prepared, and the priests stood in their place, and the Levites in their courses, according to the king's commandment. And they killed the Passover. And the priests sprinkled the blood from their hands, and the Levites flayed them. And they removed the burnt offerings 
that they might give according to the divisions of the families of the people to offer unto the Lord as it is written in the book of Moses. And so did they with the oxen. And they roasted the Passover with fire according to the ordinance, but the other holy things sawed they in pots and in cauldrons and in pans and divided them speedily among all the people. And afterward they made ready for themselves and for the priests, because the priests, the sons of Aaron, were busied in offering of burnt offerings and the fat until night. Therefore the Levites prepared for themselves and for the priests, the sons of Aaron. And the singers and the sons of Asaph were in their place, according to the commandment of David. And Asaph and Heman and Jedathan, the king's seer, and the porters waited at every gate. They might not depart from their service. For their brethren, the Levites, prepared for them. So all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover and to offer burnt offerings upon the altar of the Lord, according to the commandment of King Josiah. And the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover at that time and the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days. And there was no Passover like that, like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet, neither did all, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. And the priests and Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was the Passover kept. After all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Nico, king of Egypt, came up to fight against uh, Chachemish by Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, thou king of Judah? I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearkened not unto the words of Nico from the mouth of God, and came to fight in the valley of Meg Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah, and the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am so wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died. He was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. And Jeremiah lamented for Josiah. And all the singing men and the singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations to this day. And made them an ordinance in Israel. And behold, they are written in the Lamentations. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his goodness, according to that which was written in the law of the Lord, and his deeds first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. Praise God. Josiah kept uh, the Passover. It was a big thing. Uh, both in Israel and in Judah. Um, he said things in array, just as, as King David had said, and as Solomon had observed, and all the righteous kings that reigned before him. Um, he said them in their courses, uh, the Levites, the priests, um, the sons of Korah, the, the Kohatites, and so on and so forth. All right, they killed the Passover, they sanctified themselves, they prepared themselves, and they came before the presence of God. The verse 7 says, Josiah gave the people of the flock lambs and kids for the Passover offerings. Uh, this reminded me of Hezekiah. He did the same thing. I was teaching a couple of days ago, and I told you, I said, God is the giver of all good things. Therefore, you should be a generous giver as well. I said to you, there's nothing you have that you were not first given. You came to this world naked. You did not bring anything. That's why it should be easy for you to give. All right? Knowing that God, who is the giver, will give back to you. Luke 6, 38 is a law. Give and it shall be given unto you. You're receiving. It being given unto you is predicated on you first giving. And it's not the size of what you give that matters. Is the heart with which you give it. 
All right. As a matter of fact, it's when I need money the most that I give the most. That, that I do it religiously and God never fails. Never fails. All right. Uh, in chapter 30 of uh, verse 23, you'll see that Hezekiah did the same thing and all the princes did the same thing. Same thing here. Verse 7, Josiah the king gave the people. Verse 8, the princes also gave willingly unto the people. So people who didn't have to give, God made provision for them. He gives seed to the sower if you need to sow. Because some giving will come that doesn't match the need. You turn it into a seed. So he gives you seed to sow. And then he gives you bread to eat. That means he gives you certain seed that you have to work on and convert to bread. All right? So all of these guys with their jawbreaking na na names, uh, they set things in order, they killed the Passover, and they observed the Passover. Verse 18 says, There was no Passover like that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet, neither neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept? So his own even exceeded Hezekiah's own. Hezekiah's own was big, seven days. After seven days, the guy said, let's have another seven days, right? So his was bigger. And uh, the Bible is careful to let us know that this particular Passover was in the 18th year of his reign. So he was still pretty young. He was in his 20s when he was doing all these exploits for God. Now, after this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Nico, the king of Egypt, came up to fight against Charchemish by Euphrates, and Josiah went out against him. So he sent ambassadors to him and said, Man, I didn't come against you and your people. I came against the king of Egypt, and I didn't just come on my own. God sent me to. So this one that you've arrayed yourself in battle, first of all, to defend Egypt. Why? We have many people in the church that still defend Egypt, that defend the world and make excuses for the world. So you have a, a brother or a sister or a child or a cousin who thinks they are transgender and you won't pray and you won't talk to them about it because you don't want to offend them. God help me. There's one scripture I want to bring to your attention. My mind is telling me it's Ezekiel. Let me see. Thank you, Spirit of God. Ezekiel 18.4 is relevant. Ezekiel 18.20. But the particular one that's running around in my mind is where God says, if you don't tell people of their wrongdoing, he will require their blood from you. That's the one that's running around my mind. But Ezekiel 18, 4 and 20 is relevant. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins shall die. That's the word. Everybody must be born again. And there's no way a transgender or a homosexual can tell me that they are Christians and continue. I'm not discounting the challenge that it is. It is said of this man, I don't know, I read it many, many years ago. Uh, let me not mention his name. He's a, he's a popular uh, recording artist from the 60s. Some of you may not know him. All right. He, he was a self-professed homosexual at that time. And he made a covenant with God that he will die celibate. Rather than sin against God, he died celibate. All right. We have tolerated it. We have excused it. We have, we, have, we have sponsored studies that say this thing is true. To the point now where they say there are about 70-something genders. 
and the church is silent. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's separation from Almighty God. That's what dying is. When he told Adam and Eve not to eat of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil, he said the day you eat it, you will die. They ate it, but they didn't die because he wasn't talking about physical death. He was talking about spiritual death, and that's when man died. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, explains it. It says, as in Adam all die, even so shall all be made alive in Christ Jesus. And if we don't intercede for people, especially if you have family members who have this challenge, people that you have access to that you can, that you can intercede for and, and talk to, And then verse 20 says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die again. And if the Bible repeats something twice, it's not because God wants to be verbose. I can't remember that scripture, but I know that there's a scripture that says, if you are able to tell someone and you don't tell them, God will require their blood from your hands. Ezekiel 3.18. Ezekiel 3.18, let me check that. I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. Thank you. That's the one. That's the one. That's why my mind went to 18.3. <laughs> Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Who gave me that scripture? Angela. Thank you. All right. Uh, so where was I before I said, Wade? Yeah, we we're talking about Josiah going to uh, meddle with uh, Neko. Uh, when Josiah prepared the temple, Neko, the king of Egypt, came to fight with Carchemish by Euphrates. Okay, so um, he went to defend uh, Carchemish against uh, Neko, the king of Egypt. All right? One, he didn't inquire of the Lord if he should get involved or not. Turns out that God sent the king of Egypt. All right? Maybe he remembered history that Egypt did much evil to Israel. And he felt, let me, let me, let me, let me challenge the king of Egypt. All right? You're still holding the grudge of two weeks ago, two months ago. Person has since repented and moved on with God, and you're still holding on to the grudge. Because that person has a history with you. You've written them off. They can never change. Even when Neko said to him, God told me to do this, he didn't listen. And that's what put him in trouble. So all of his good deeds, he didn't end up too great. He sent ambassadors to him to say, to say, what have I to do with you? Verse 21, king of Judah, I didn't come against you today. I came against the house that I have a problem with. God commanded me to make his and uh, commanded me to do so. So don't meddle with the instructions God gave me. He is with me. If you come against me, you will destroy yourself because you're not coming against me. You're coming against the God who sent me. Deep lessons to be learned there. All right. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him. Now look at Josiah who has been doing everything right up until this point. That's why the Bible says, let him that standeth take heed lest he fall. We're not invincible. We're still in this flesh. And the flesh is crazy. That's why you must walk closely with the spirit of God. And ask him. 
He's with you 24 7. I talked, I asked him, Lord, where did I put my glasses? Sometimes I set my glasses down and I'm looking for it. It's how the conversation between me and God goes. Talk to him all the time. Ask him concerning whatever all the time. You've got to maintain that kind of relationship with the Spirit of God. He wouldn't listen. He disguised himself so that he might still fight with him. He hearkened not to the words of Nico, verse 22, from the mouth of God, because he had written Egypt off. How can God speak to Egypt? Look at what Egypt did to Israel. It's not possible for God to use that man. He's a sinner. The Bible says, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his master, he stands or falls. Someone put that scripture up. As he went to war in the valley of Megiddo, the archers shot at him. And then he told the people who came with him, he said, please take me away. I am badly wounded. They took him out of the chariot, put him in the second chariot that he had, and they brought him back to Jerusalem where he died. He didn't close out well. He lived well. He did well. But his end was not so great. He died in disobedience. The Bible says the rest of the acts of Josiah and his goodness is written in the law of the Lord. His deeds, first and last, are written in the book of Kings. Questions, comments, thoughts. Only one person has their camera on, so I can't tell if you're even here or not. Have any questions? Do you have any comments? What do I have to ask every time for you to put your cameras on? I, I'm not dealing with children. Yeah, work is understandable. But if you're not, why why won't you put your camera on? Craig. Good morning. Good good morning or good evening. I just I just I just say good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> um I just had a question. Um I'll piggybacking off what you said. Uh, to me yesterday that um, you know I should start praying in tongues again um, I I tried but it, I don't know the best way I can describe it it, it was, it was kind of like I, I, I was stuck D do you know when you know how some like if you're a writer you say that you have um, writer's block you don't know how to overcome it that that's how I felt. I'm um, kind of chapter thirty six. Then the people of the land took Jeho Ahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. Jeho Ahaz was twenty and three years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in an an hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem and turned his name to Jehoiakim. And Nico took Jehoiakim as his brother and carried him to Egypt. Jehoiakim was 20 and five years old when he began to reign and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. 
nor the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and his abominations which he did, and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiachin, his son, reigned in his stead. Jehoiachin his, was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was one and 20 years old when he began to reign and reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he, ha which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. For they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of God rose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on, upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a pro proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth had the Lord God of heaven given me, and he had charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Praise God. All right. Bring this study of the second uh, book of Chronicles to a close. So the people of the land took Jehu is Ahaz and made him king, uh, after his father Josiah, who died from pursuing Niku, king of Egypt, in the war against uh, Carchemish uh, by Euphrates. He was 23 years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. And then Niku, the king of Egypt, came after him because, I guess, of what his father had done. Um, so he put him down at Jerusalem. He condemned the land and he made Jerusalem began, begin to pay tribute, a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And then he took Eliakim, the younger brother, to um, Jeho Ahaz. He took his younger brother, made him king over Judah and Jerusalem, changed his name from Eliakim to Jeho, Jehoiakim. All right. So Neko took Jehoiaz, the firstborn of his father, of his Jeho, whatever. They're all so complicated. Josiah. <laughs> so he took Jehoiakim to, uh, sorry, he took uh, Jehoiaz, took him with him to um, Egypt. The five. Jehoiakim began to reign. That's the one he changed his name from Eliakim. Began to reign 25 and years uh, and five years old when he began to reign. He only reigned for 11 years and he did evil in the sight of God. It was during this time that Nebuchadnezzar was charged by God.
to invade Israel and they took them away for 70 years. All right. Um, he took them, uh, he took him away for 70 years. He carried the vessels of the house of God. Uh, you remember uh, where we're, yeah, we've done it in the book of Kings when he went to drink with the vessels from the house of God and a handwriting showed up on the wall that says, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Fasen. You have been weighed in the balances and you're found wanting. All right. And God sent him on a safari trip. He went to live in the wilderness for seven years. Praise God. Um, so the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all of his abominations, which he did, uh, they're written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, first and second kings. His own son, Jehoiachin, then reigned in his stead. He started to reign at eight years old, and he too did evil in the sight of God. That was the year that uh, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him from Babylon, and he put another king there. Zedekiah, his brother, to rule over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was 21 when he started to rule. All right. And he also did that which was evil, which justifies them being in captivity 70 years. They didn't repent because every time they would repent, God would have mercy. All right. He rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God, but he was stiff necked and his heart was hardened uh, from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. All the chief priests and all the people transgressed. They followed all the heathen nations around them. They polluted the house of God. They did not hallow Jerusalem. Even though God would raise uh, uh, messengers time and time again. Verse 15 tells us that. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up betimes. Time and time again. God would send somebody to them because he had compassion on them. God had compassion on them, even though they were in sin. But they would mock the messengers, they would despise the messengers, such as they did to Jeremiah. When we get there, you'll see it. All right, they didn't listen until there was no remedy. So he brought the king of the Chaldeans against them. He had no compassion. He didn't care for the aged, he didn't care for youth, male or female. He, he just... He just, just didn't care. Um, he took the vessels of the house of God, great and small. He plundered Israel, in, 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 in short. And then they burnt the house of God. They break down the wall of Jerusalem. They burnt all the palaces in there. They destroyed all the goodly vessels. All right? Those that escaped from the sword, they carried away to Babylon. And they became servants in uh, the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. We'll see that when we get there. Until the land had enjoyed a Sabbath, 70 years. The land had to rest for 70 years. All right. Because they didn't observe the Sabbath. They didn't observe uh, any of Moses, uh, the laws that God gave Moses. So in the first year of King Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord came by the mouth of Jeremiah, and God stirred up the heart of Cyrus to go back and rebuild the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. Again, we'll, we'll read that in greater detail when we come to the book of Isaiah, because Isaiah writes about King Cyrus in Isaiah 45. Any questions, any thoughts, any comments, any patterns that you see? Any part of the scripture that you see that's applicable, either in our society today or in your personal life? or in anything that you've observed. Anyone? Are we all still together? Yes, ma'am. All right, if you don't have any questions or comments, then I guess we can bring the study of Second Chronicles to a close. Bless God for all. Tomorrow is prayer. I want to encourage you to come. God is doing tremendous things in the fellowship. He's answering our prayers. 
And he's just he's just faithful. We love the Lord so much. He's good and he's kind and his mercies endure forever. Amen.